Welcome back to The Fire Break. I'm Steve Wolf. As always, The Fire Break is sponsored by Team Wildfire, developing new techniques and technology for reducing the damaging impact of our most severe wildfires. I've got an amazing guest with us today. This is and not, not just a guest, but my friend, Dan Reese, who, who I've uh, known for many years. And of all of the guests that I've had, you know, there's a small club of them that uh, we get to put into the been there, done that club. And uh, Dan, you're, you're, you're certainly in that club, having been a deputy chief at Cal Fire, having worked in uh, forestry, having run Global Super Tanker, and now running the International Wildfire Consulting Group. Dan, welcome to the fire break. How are you today? Well, Steve, I'm wonderful. Thank you for having me on your podcast today. It's, it's exciting uh, for sure to always talk about things that are near and dear to our heart and that we uh, really are passionate about. Absolutely. So tell me about the, uh, the International Wildfire Consulting Group. What are you working on there? Well, uh, when, I, when we say group, it's typically myself, and then it becomes group whenever people engage me with projects. And, you know, throughout my lifetime and my career, I, I've, I've worked with some really uh, fantastic, amazing people. And every now and then there's a project that comes up. Um, you know, if we talk about, uh, you know, the IQ in this group, I've probably got the lowest and, and the highest IQ or the people I surround myself with that are really specialists, you know, in, in what they bring to the table. So uh, this was a group that I started uh, when Global Super Tanker ceased operations uh, to stage your main and within the game and be able to help out, uh, you know, the the wildland fire community and the fire community as a whole. Uh, Cal Fire was an all risk department. So I feel um, comfortable uh, throughout the spectrum of fire, whether it's, you know, structure and, and nozzles or wildland and whatever happens in that. The last half of my career really with um, Cal Fire was dedicated to aviation um, and, and several other programs. So uh, it's, been a, it's been a fun venture. Well, to, to step back from like tech talk and just say like from pure coolness factor, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if they measure that data metric, uh, but from a, from a pure coolness factor, like, you know, watching the red sludge fall out of the big airplanes is like why people like to watch wildfires, right? That's, that's the bit that makes it on the news and, uh, you know, that we associate with serious wildfire attack. And you're the guy flying those planes. So that's like, Pretty damn cool, I think, in in most people's mind. Um, before we catch up currently, you know, what was that like uh, flying missions uh, for Cal Fire and and subsequently with Global Super Tanker? Well, to be quite frank, uh, the first few times I did it, uh, depending on the time in my career, I was sick to my stomach and thought I was going to vomit every time I got in the cockpit. <laughs> it took it took a little while you know, to acclimate to what was going on and be comfortable in yourself and your decision-making processes uh, to be able to function, you know, in the air with those um, really spectacular aviation crews that are just really have their science, you know, their, their art, I, I call it art, you know, honed. Um, it, it was really wonderful. The department, like anything, puts you through uh, amazing training, and this is uh, now interagency training for people to go through. And, you know, if you can make the cut and get through the task books and, and you're fortunate enough to get picked up in a, you know, at a station or a position to where you can engage, um, it, it, it's wonderful. And, and I was able to do that with an amazing department. Uh, I, I started out, um, you know, in the wildland arena, and then I went into the municipal arena and then I went into the aviation arena as a single uh, helicopter you know manager um, and even to get to that point um, I was a part of a county rescue team uh, that was uh, trained to uh, do rescue operations um, out of a helicopter so that's kind of where I got my my teeth cut in the fire service uh, per se um, and then was able to just kind of climb up through the ladder that way and eventually you know on a helicopter as a captain and and uh when they tried to put me in the front seat i think i had both feet and both arms out um holding myself away from that cockpit <laughs> uh just because of the intimidation factor and you know learning what you need to do when you're in that position yeah. and then uh you know just went up and and became a, a air tactical what they call them an air tactical group supervisor 
And, and that's where they teach you, you know, command and control and aircraft separation and safe operations in the sky over an incident where, where you know, I got to hone my skills and uh, coordinate, you know, aircraft, helicopters and air tankers and for many, many different kinds of missions on, on um, emergency incidents, right? It could be anything. Um, predominantly, it was wildfire for me, but within those... Uh, fires we had multiple mission sets it might be you know rescue or search or you know cargo or uh suppression or uh mapping and recon i mean it was it was uh, across the board um so it was it was a lot of fun uh i got to be able to be a part of developing some amazing programs the very large air tanker program uh for cal fire with the dc-10s was one of those programs and, uh, and DC tens are no longer even considered right, very large compared to some of the other airplanes you've got to play with, right? You know, uh, well, I did get to play with one that was a little bit bigger. Um, the DC tens are the only ones flying right now in, in the space that are that large. They're um, right at nine thousand uh, plus gallons. Um, uh, and, and they evolved too. Uh, when they first started, when uh, uh, we had them with Cal Fire, they were at uh, twelve thousand gallons. And then they, you know, they honed the systems, and and you have to operate within the specifications of what the FAA and the the agency's criteria are. Um, so that gave me great insight, uh, you know, and be able being able to um, develop those programs, and so. Uh, I was headhunted to run Global Super Tanker uh, several years after I retired, and, and that was a, a, another great um, gig. That was describe totally what scary. that what Global Super Tanker was. So Global Super Tanker was a, an aircraft that was um, it was a converted passenger aircraft. Uh, it went through the Boeing conversion line out of Japan Airlines when it retired as a passenger aircraft, and they made a cargo uh, hauler out of it. And then a company uh, developed um, a drop system to put into the the, the main um, cabin uh, of that aircraft. What and type it, of aircraft was it? It was a 747. It was a 747-400, a Boeing, which big is a big, boy. it's a big airplane. It used to be called the Queen of the Skies. <laughs> yeah. And, and, so and if we, you filled that thing, uh, you know, Never mind, like local regs. Like, how many gallons could you carry with that? Just twenty thousand gallons. Twenty thousand gallons. Okay. 20, so nothing 000. really like that out there now. Uh, nothing out there like that now. No, nope. the DC tens are the biggest. It was twenty thousand gallons, and by the time we got through um, retrofitting and upgrading the drop system, um, we could get about eighteen six out of it. You'd have to keep the twenty on, but we could get about eighteen thousand, uh, just over eighteen thousand gallons out on a drop. But that's uh, a lot of a lot of gallons. But that's now, a lot of gallons. That's a big that's a big big uh, uh, retardant line to help firefighters out for sure. Yeah, I would think that that would be missed, right? I mean, it's nice to go out there with your you know your handgun and your rifle and your grenade, you know. But it's nice knowing you have the nuclear option in your back pocket there. And you know, you know, right now we're like we're back down to mostly the you know small arms equivalents. Uh, Right. And that that big option doesn't exist anymore. Well, Steve, everything is an evolution. And, and, you know, I know, you know, full well, you know, being in the innovative space of trying to develop new technologies um, to be able to engage uh, in, in wildfires. Uh, and this was no different, really. It, it took a long time for people to be able to trust. It took a long time to be able to develop the airplane to do what the government needed and wanted it to do to operate within the envelope, you know, that we could operate. Um, it's a tough space. Uh, and so by the time we got it done, unfortunately, uh, we were in the midst and throes of COVID. And, and most people really aren't familiar with uh you know, they hear that there was a logistics chain problem, but all of a sudden when everyone's home and we were behind ordering it anyway, and now nobody wants to go out and everybody wants to order, uh, you know, most people don't realize that their products, when they order on Amazon or Fed FedEx and they're shipped around the country, much of those goods were shipped in the bellies of cargo wide body airplanes that are, or air, passenger airplanes. So you go from San Francisco to uh, Europe, 
in a big wide body. It had your luggage, but it also had a, a vast amount of cargo that, that would uh, for commerce that would go back and forth. So um, COVID further um, strained that logistics system because all the wide bodies shut down. No one was traveling. Oh, and and so that airplane uh, being the last airplane off the Boeing cargo conversion uh, uh, program was a unicorn um, to be able to try and get merchandise around the world. And so it was just a better decision for those, uh, you know, that that were engaged in that airplane to engage it in another genre other than a part time fire. Sure. I mean, they probably they could they could stop trying to put out uh, wildfires with it and use it to ship cheap imitation iPhone charging cords around the world for Amazon. <laughs> there you go. Everybody got their iPhones, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, okay. Yeah, well, it was a real gut wrencher. It was a, I'm not lying. It was a gut punch. It, 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 um, it made a lot of us sick, uh, but it, you know, you have to put your, your understanding really on the other side too, on what they're doing and, and sure. you know, the gamble that they took to, to do it and what it meant for the rest of the world. Right, because uh, you know, fighting wildfires is a is a government private partnership, in in many respects, and while the private side can be you know infinitely funded with taxpayer dollars to to the extent of their willingness, uh, the private side has to be profitable. Absolutely, yeah. Right. And, and so I I imagine the the shareholders and the airplane said, you know, we've got to maximize our profit on this investment. Uh, Sorry, wildfire guys. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It was a great tool. I mean, you know, when you talk about capacity, when you when you look at the the numbers of other aircraft that have to be engaged during times of, you know, heavy suppression, if you will, or whether you're trying to hold something, uh, build a box around it. It was a great tool. You know, it, it it would take the place of seven, you know, at least seven large air tankers that we see in our fleet right now, or 32 single engine air tankers, or, you know, uh, two DC 10s. It was, it was a great program. Uh, you know, and maybe someday, uh, through evolution, we'll have some more, uh, technologies that advance and come along. A lot of our aircraft in the, in the fleet right now are, are um, older. Uh, generation aircraft. M many of those aircraft in the tanker world are uh, have outlived their life as passenger haulers, and that's typically how they get converted. So it's not like there's a, a you know a purpose built air tanker out there that doesn't exist. Uh, there they have purpose built scoopers, which uh, scoop water off of lakes and you know bodies of water, rivers, that type of thing. That are great suppression tools. You know, when you've got a water source nearby, they can they can scoop a lot of water and put a lot of water down to help firefighters. But um, you know, it's a toolbox. Firefighters need a toolbox. And, right, uh, another tool in the arsenal. Just have one wrench or one hammer, right? Heck no! Look over here. Right. And a wall of them, right? Yeah. yeah. So you you talked about you know uh, purpose. Where exactly in the armory in term of, of of purposes? or needs, uh, does aerial fire suppression fall? Because when I, I've talked to you in the past, you, you told me, you know, these are amazing tools. They do some things really well, but you cannot put up a fire strictly aerially, right? I think your quote was, you told me you could blanket the sky with aluminum and you'd still never put the fire out. Uh, correct, that's a correct statement. And most people don't really realize that. Um... You know, you can get a finite number of aircraft in the air at any one time, but, you know, when we talk about uh, fires that are really devastating, I mean, really devastating, there are those fires that get up and just, you know, within what we call the, the, um, the wooey, um, those fires, when the wind blows as hard as it does, when the fuel's available, when Mother Nature decides, okay, it's time to go, it's equivalent to a hurricane or a tidal wave or a tsunami or, you know, an earthquake. They're just, there's very little that you're going to, that we, you know, as a human species is going to be able to do. Uh, when those sometimes large, often devastating wildfires occur, they occur in extreme conditions where the wind, it, it, it surpasses the threshold for which we can safely fly aircraft. 
And even if we can fly those aircraft, a lot of times the, the stuff, the agents, whether it's water or long-term retardant, it just becomes ineffective. Um, a lot of people think that fire moves as if you pour a glass of water on a counter and there's just a wave of water that moves across. That, that's not the way fire moves. Um, fire moves uh, through ember cast. Um, so anybody that's sat around roasting marshmallows at night in a fire, see the little glowing embers, you know, come up from the fire. And, and those embers are small, but, you know, in a huge wildfire, those embers can be trees or four by eight sheets of plywood or, you know, uh, one foot pine cones. I mean, the, the power of fire when it's really running is is un, unimaginable to most of the public. Um, but uh, for those of us that have been in it, it is extremely powerful. And those fire brands and ember, we call them ember storms, land out ahead of the fire in the direction the fire is going where the wind carries those embers. And those embers land in what we call susceptible fuel beds. And depending on the weather patterns for the day, uh, you know, it may be 100% ignition, meaning every single ember that lands is going to start a new little fire. So now you have the wave of fire coming at you, but then out in front of it, you have a thousand little fires anywhere from 50 feet to a quarter or half a mile away. And all those little fires all of a sudden burn together really rapidly. And, and then you have another fire front and it just keeps escalating that way like a wave. And so, you know, when we have fires that travel at those extreme speeds and volumes and heat, that's where it's new for the public to understand how easy it is for towns to incinerate. And, you know, we're used to trees and grass growing, but now all of a sudden we have house to house. We have, you know, right. structure ignition, um, sustaining it. And when structures burn, they put up even larger, you know, different kinds of embers that then go down range and start more fires. So that's where, you know, people are now starting to understand that they need to be very proactive themselves. They need to harden their structures. They need to, uh, uh use different kinds of building material, pay attention when you live in that wild, uh, land urban interface zone, the WUI, that uh, that you're protecting yourself and you're protecting your investment uh, to the best that you can. Yeah, I, I think what you know, even calling it the WUI may give people a false sense of security. It's like, well, I, I'm just in a suburban neighborhood. I'm not backed up against you know 200 million acres of national forestry. So, you know, how is this the WUI, right? And, and so, uh, you could tell me whether this is worthwhile or not, but I've coined a phrase, the GUI, uh, and the GUI is the grassland urban interface, right? That, that being next to grasslands or fields is every bit as dangerous as being backed up against, a, you know, a national park. Right. It's all wildland, right? It's yeah. uh, whether it's a forest or a brushland or grass, it, it, it's all, you know, it, it, it's, it's a wild area that interfaces with an urban area. And, and the problem is when that urban area starts to ignite and because um, structure hardening hasn't been done, now the heat, you know, the energy release component, if you will, you know, the amount of heat and BTUs coming are sustained. They're there for a long time. They, they you know, just by conduction, they can go from house to house to house. Uh, you know, that, that sustained heat continues to throw out big embers downstream and it just, you know, is a vicious cycle and circle. And then we end up in these terrible situations where we lose, you know, entire towns or entire communities. Uh, so, you know, people being proactive is a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. And, and not only that, it's a big deal for everybody in the country because we all pay for it. Um, you know, somebody in New York, you know, their taxes, unbeknownst to them, are going to, you know, the problem on the western seaboard where we have these fires. No different than the tax money from the western seaboard is going to the hurricane problems that are on the eastern seaboard. So it, it's something that we all need to pay attention to. Uh, is all this sure. money going back and forth in the bellies of cargo planes? Yeah, right. 
uh, well, well, that or, or, or through, you know, assistance organizations trying to reimburse, you know, FEMA or sure. otherwise. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Steve, backing up a minute, you asked the question about, um, you know, airplanes and their effectiveness. There are, there are yeah, there's be the sweet spot, the sweet spot, right? So if we look at the, if we look at the extreme of fire, it's, you know, you can have a fire that burns for a month, but maybe it's big runs happen seven days in that entire month or two months, right? Or those anomaly weather factors that drive fire. And so for the, for the baseline everyday average fire, uh, a group asked me one time, well, how do you know that air tankers are effective? And in case of, you know, running super tanker, you know, I, I answered to a board and an investment group and they wanted to know, look, is this business worth um, chasing? Is this uh, something worthwhile for us to keep our, you know, uh, keep funding? And uh, so I, I gathered uh, five years worth of federal data. And uh, once I got the data, you know, I'm, I'm, I got. I, gra I graduated, but I'm not a I'm, I'm not a data guy. I'm not a cruncher, or a, an economist, or a statistician. Um, but I found a group out of uh, Washington D.C. from George Mason University that were able to take that data, and it was a massive data set, five years worth of uh, of, of fire in the United States, um, all of which received um, fixed wing, we call them air tanker uh, support. And George Mason University School of Economics and Policy um, did two things for me. Uh, one, they they di they dissected the data and they ran statistical analysis on them to see, you know, what it said. And then they developed an economic report to show us what we are spending, both realized and unrealized, within the United States annually every year. Well, the economic report showed that we spend tens of billions of dollars a year in uh, realized and unrealized costs for the wildfire problem in the United States. And this was uh, in 2020 when COVID hit, so it didn't make big news. Tens of billions, that's with a big B, yeah, uh, not an M. Um, and then on the other side, on the air tanker side, uh, it was unequivocally hands down, like they ran uh, data set after data set after data set to prove it because I didn't know what the data was going to show. I had an idea, but I didn't know. And, and I said, Dr. Fuller, whatever happens, you know, I, I don't care what the data shows. It just needs to be the same whether you look at it or some other school or university or statistician looks at it. And what it showed was unequivocally that rapid initial attack with large air tankers uh, does two things. One, it impacts size of the fire and duration of the fire. Now, that's not every single time because there are those fires where I can have a DC-10 and I can watch the fire start and not stop it. I mean, with a DC-10, right, or, or a 747. There are those kinds of fires that will happen. But on average... Uh, you know, these fires, if we can get to them quickly, but then now we're seeing where maybe all of this, um, fire suppression over the years has allowed the forest to build up, you know, uh, uh, a large amount of fuel, if you will, right. More trees, more brush, more grass. The and fuel then now, drop. right. We've perpetuated the problem. Well, we can say that for sure. But we can also uh, see where we've got these um, damaging fires that happen maybe, um, you know, once every couple of years in the same in the same footprint. So when I was flying fires, uh, I went to the same fire, the same fire in the same space multiple times in my career. Um, both damaging, you know, it just depends on the vegetation that grows back, the weather factors, how dry it is, how wet it was the year before. Um, but, but there's no doubt that there needs to be a balance, right? And in, in, in our country, uh, you know, we used to log a lot in the national forests, and now we don't do that. Um, the private uh, timber industries do, you know, they, they log and there's a, there's a big difference in when you look at 
um, forest health or, you know, the growth of, of forest in, in an area that's been burned and just left feral versus an area that's been burned and then, if you will, rehabbed, you know, new trees planted, you know, things like that. And, and so... And how it's rehabbed, whether it's a monoculture or exactly. a, a natural... Yeah, yeah. Natural sure. emulation. Uh-huh. Well, well that, that I think, for, first of all, kudos to you uh, for finding that pocket of intelligence in Washington, D.C., something many people have looked for and doubt the existence of. All right. Uh, the, that's huge. Um, to, and and my, my other question is about, you know, wildfire itself versus wildfire destruction. And I think we're seeing more and more of an importance in making that distinction that we're not trying to fight wildfires any more than we're trying to fight tidal waves or hurricanes, right? What we're trying to do is minimize their destructive impact. So, yes, obviously, if you can get to that fire fast and contain it, you, you minimize the, you know, the likelihood of a spread into a destructive fire. Are there times where you, the, the pace of the fire or the, the intensity of the fire tells you, like, we're not going to get perimeter containment on this. Can you then repurpose the aircraft for uh, hardening? Can you, you know, instead of attacking the fire over here, drop it around the homes over here so that it, when it gets there, it's hitting you know, a, a retardant barrier or for evacuation route hardening. How do you distinguish in between when you do each, if you do the second one? Got it. Well, that goes down to the the tools and the toolbox available to the incident commander and the air operations, you know, people that are working that incident. Um, helicopters work under the smoke um, far easier than, than air tankers. We don't you know, if anybody's watched that famous uh, uh, air tanker movie, Always, uh, I think it was with John Goodman. It was it was a really exciting um, film to watch. But in reality, we don't fly through trees and, and fire with, with aircraft, and we try and keep them out of the smoke. We fly where we can see, and we have great visibility, and we're not going to, you know, get somebody hurt, cough an engine, run into a, run into a mountainside, or take a wing off with a tree. The mountain always um, wins. Right, always, always. Yeah. So uh, our, our mantra really, even on the ground, is anchor and flank, uh, meaning uh, we have to establish a beachhead somewhere and work from that beachhead so that we don't get flanked and the fire come around and burn us. And, and we do that on the ground all the time. You know, when I had a, an engine crew or my helitack crew, we would always make sure that we were well anchored that nothing could come around, you know, under us and, and you know, outflank us and, and hurt us, right, or, or trap us. Right. So with aircraft, we do the same thing. And, and it's important to remember that air tankers are limited, right? I mean, if we look at the state of California, they have 21 or 22 air tankers themselves, and they still rely on the federal fleet to be able to come in and help them. And that's just for one state. Um, and there are, you know, you've got Oregon and, and Washington, and then you've got the bordering western states that burn a lot, and then the interior states uh, where we have fires. And the large air tanker uh, component really was built and designed to protect federal lands and the federal forests, not state and local lands, which, you know, when we talk about um, volume of fires, the volume of fires really remains pretty um, stable. It's about 7 million a year on average, give or take, in the United States. Give or take, on average, about 50% of those are on public and state lands and 50% of those are on federal lands. But the large air tanker component, is it's an expensive component, and it's a, it's a large program to manage, and it's a large program to try and keep standardized for use across borders. Yeah. And, you know, you've got your property, I have my property, the state has their property, you know, there might be several federal entities that have their properties, of which fire doesn't care, right? Fire is not going to abide by a boundary, it's going to burn where it wants, and it might cross several boundaries. So it's important for the public to understand, and for our state and federal legislators, that where we use, you know, air tankers, um, 
the the federal air tanker component while we might say there aren't enough the federal agencies have said they've got enough for the protection of those federal lands but what's important for the public to realize and the state and local governments is anytime we get a large air tanker typically it's because we're borrowing them from the federal lands when they're available right it's not like we have a tactical spread like we have in our fire stations around a city to protect the population right that's a moving target and you you know you you, you move those assets as best you can uh, for what's at stake but ultimately you're we're, we are going to have lightning busts that come through a lightning siege and it's going to start a, a number of fires in a region and 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 now we're going to you know commit resources to that area but then you know there are managers accountable to make sure that they don't strip all the resources from their area that if they've got a fire you know they don't stop it and so it's a it's a balancing act and and it's not an easy balancing act you know no. for for the states or or for the federal agencies but the you know the the question is really if we are going to decide to suppress a fire and not let it burn um do we need more resources and who's responsible for those resources you know those resources those kinds of resources run into the millions but we already know that the ramifications of that not happening are annually are tens of billions of dollars so you couple that now with a balancing act with um, not having the capacity with the uh, the human capital needed right we we see not only in the fire service but in the maintenance world for aviation and, and i think in any whether it's a restaurant owner or some store owner you know finding people human capital to be able to work and to be able to afford to pay them in our current economy to be able to be able to maintain um, some sort of profitability is becoming difficult so that's where you know all of this bleeds into politics, bleeds into really what's available uh, to be used. And so while we use air tankers to stop fires, we hold them with air tankers. Every now and then we get lucky and we put one out because the conditions, the relative humidity, the fuel types are such that we can do it. But, you know, what happens mostly is we support those on the ground in the air. And it's really going to be those firefighters on the ground that have to go dig that fire out and make sure it's not going to get up and go somewhere, right? We can we can hold fires with air tankers. We can hold fires with helicopters. But it's going to take a human element to go in to do that. And all those resources are limited. And, and when, when the wind blows and things um, evolve rapidly, there's never going to be enough help. And, and that's where it becomes incumbent on the population within our country to to be able to be prepared themselves right so don't yeah, rely yeah. on the fire service to go protect you and protect your home do what you can do to protect your home so that when we get there we don't have to use our scant resources and human capital to just park in front of your driveway and help you right we're better off taking those scant resources chances are they're going to be involved in perimeter control, right? Which maybe I give up this number of houses to save that number of houses, because if I don't stop the fire, it's, con it's going to continue to burn and get bigger and threaten more population. Um, so perimeter control is a, a big deal for sure. And, and, you know, accountability on the home and property owners is more onus and, if I could, if I could orally, you know, put a highlighter on what you said, you know, we would be highlighting the importance of personal responsibility. Uh, exactly. In, in, right. right. In, in maintaining the uh, non-flammability of one's home and, exactly. and, and you know, fire escaping. Um, yeah. Uh, very, very essential. And there's plenty of resources online for people to find about what they need to do, you know, to harden their, their homes. Uh, you talked about limited resources, you know, particularly labor. Um, tell me about the allocation of those resources to mop up, you know, versus fire line digging. Because in my mind, the idea of getting out there with the Pulaski 
uh, or other any other medieval gardening tool and and trying to you know create a fire break i mean it's a great name for a podcast don't get me wrong but uh-huh. i i'm not sure if what you described in terms of ember cast and firebrand dispersal you know is the way it is which it is then yeah. you know how do we think that digging a line by hand is going to prevent the forward movement of a fire because these firebrands land miles away you know 20 30 miles out and and yet we allocate you know thousands of people towards uh you know high speed gardening tell me like why do we do that? Is is it still effective? Is it a carryover from when the environment was less fuel overloaded or winds weren't as high? Where do we come down on that? Well, for me, um, uh, it, it boils down to having to have the human capital. You have to have those crews to be able to go in um, where you anchor and flank to be able to stop a fire, right? When it's burning, you know, putting anybody out in front of something that's running hot and hard and heavy is extremely dangerous. So typically, you know, we'll we'll engage that fire in an indirect manner, if you will, you know, out in front of it. Um, and, And that adds to the complexity of what we're talking about. So while I can go to the origin of the fire, right, and, and let's say the the fire is moving in a specific direction. The safest place for my firefighters is at the heel of the fire where it just started. And then to attack that fire and flank it, you know, up the flanks, chasing the head to where we get to the shoulders and the head of the fire. So that's where, you know, in the past, we've been able to take advantage of, um, nighttime operations where typically the relative humidity comes up the fire starts to lay down the sun goes down it gets cooler um the 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 fuel and the vegetation isn't superheated by the sun you know a a lot of things happen but that's not always a given you know we find times where all of a sudden uh, a particular wind pattern surfaces and the humidities drop at night and the wind picks up or switches and goes another direction um We've had some interesting weather patterns uh, develop to where sometimes maybe it's not always the case where you can really go after a fire at night. I used to say with timber fires, a good friend of mine um, would say, look, you really need to go after these fires at night when they're laying down. And it's true. Anytime the fire is laying down, you have to go after it. But oftentimes, you know, when the when the switch flips and and the fire begins to pick up a head of steam, now you're fighting just to hang on to what you did uh, the night before or when the wind was down, right? Um, you do have to attack the fire and turn the corner sooner or later across the shoulders and the head to put it out. Um, firefighters use a number of ways to do that. They, you know, find a ridge where they think that they can, um, you know, stop it. Uh, a natural landmark. They get out way ahead of it with these numbers of crews you're talking about and they engage firing operations out in front of it to try and put yeah. distance right between the line that they know they can hold and an area where they can hold they put in what's called contingency lines out in front but there's no guarantee and so anyone with an air tanker will advocate you know it's it's a bit like playing russian roulette if you think you're going to take those air tankers and put a line out in front it's a gamble because you don't know if one of those embers is going to jump across the line. And if it does, are you going to have holding crews to be able to hold it? So that's what, you know, makes wildland fire, you know, so challenging. It's not that the fire's smart. Right. We know what the fire's going to do. We don't always know what the weather's going to do. Um, we, we have great meteorologists and people that follow us on these fires and they brief the fire crews every morning and there are meteorologists that, that um, study this and, and give reports to the command staff uh, a, a, on a 24-7 basis um, because that's how we get firefighters hurt. They don't realize something's coming in. They don't realize the weather pattern uh, that they're dealing with. So we still have to have you know those people and those crews. And if we don't, it, we're never going to catch a fire. It's just not going to no. happen. 
Dan, let me ask you about innovation in the space. You talked about, you know, when embers move forward, they have to find that uh, receptive fuel bed in order to, to take off. And the same thing, you know, in the innovation space. There's like people who have a good idea, but then it has to land on the right uh, environment, you know, for it to come to fruition, right? It has right, to right. get buy-in, you have to have financing, you have to have engineering, you have to have, you know, the marketing, all, all of this has to go to get a, new, a good new idea. What do you see as the innovation landscape? Is the fire community receptive to that? Is the contracting model contrary to that you know what what's helping and what's hurting uh the fire service's ability to to get access to new technologies well th there's a lot to that question steve um a lot of it in, in to, under 10 hours yeah in under 10 hours right, <laughs> right. Yeah. a lot of it has to do with um government policy and, and contracting right how things can be procured what can be procured how long you know before it can be procured um, there's the firefighters are a little bit abrasive to change, right? When you're coming up, you know, it works and, and you kind of have an idea. It doesn't, what doesn't work. And anytime there's a fumble, you're going to go right back to what, you know, worked before. So I think that that's just human nature where, you know, we're, a lot of us are abrasive to change. There's a few out of the box thinkers, but it takes time to win someone over to see, you know, a new technology really work and, and how does that technology work? You know, when you put it in the hands of the firefighter, um, um, I guess well, you break it faster, right? Is the, is the juice worth the squeeze? Meaning yeah. if I'm going to pay this much, how much really is it going to, uh, make my job easier? Is it, is it going to make my job easier because I have better intelligence because I know how big the fire is or where it's going? I'd advocate not. A little bit, but, yeah. you know, as firefighters, we know which direction the fire is going and, and we basically have an idea of the weather and we've got fuel behavior analysts out there that were pretty good about telling us, you know, what to expect and where it was going to go. Uh, as our as our weather patterns and fuel identifications get better and we know the consistency and we can use imagery and things like that, we can probably better calculate what that fire behavior is going to be for contingency planning or for how to engage those crews, which is wonderful. But uh, capacity still remains a, a big challenge. So um, it's like the DC-10. No one will argue today that it's a great air tanker, right? It can deliver a big cannon punch load. It's a formidable aircraft. It, it, it uh, moves in the airspace and can be integrated with other aerial operations. But for the first three years of its operation, and I had a pretty good reputation in the department and a, and a pretty good handful of people that I brought in to help run that program, but people would still run for me like a used car salesman when I would walk into the fire camp because they thought, oh, Reese is coming and he's going to make us use that damn airplane and it's going to cost us a fortune and our, you know, so... It took a long time for, for people to realize that a tool like that can be used. And I would say that's the same for any technology. Um, yeah. Now can I separate the technologies? Sure. Because uh, the technologies seem to bifurcate, you know, informational technologies versus, okay, I'll just kind of say it, actually helpful technologies. Because, Hands on. Right? Yes. It, well, you know, h hardware, hardware and chemistry right. versus data. Because what you seem to be saying was that, you, you, you know, the, the data tools were largely redundant, were somewhat unnecessary, that, you know, any decent incident command team can pretty well figure out where a fire is and where it's going. Uh, and I've never seen a fire team run from a fire yelling, get me some more sensors, you know, get me some more cameras, get me some more satellites, right? You yeah. know, what they're missing is like, the bigger guns, right? If someone's breaking in my house, do I want more cameras or do I want a bigger gun? And yeah. so it, it seems like a lot of the innovation dollars have gone into data as if, if you had enough data, you could douse a fire with it. And that's, you know, not the case. Um, so people who actually like to, you know, pick up a, a physical tool and build a thing with it or grab some test tubes and make a chemical, you know, I think that's where we're gonna see the biggest payoff 
uh, and yet it's probably the most difficult aspect of you know of startups to get funded what, what do you what do you think about that and what do you what are you seeing in terms of like actually better suppression tools or better uh you know hardening tools so uh we talked about the public and the part that they can play in hardening their homes right, right. there's always new technologies okay. coming out whether it's you know, building materials, uh, fire, fire safe councils, you know, helping, you know, neighborhoods, uh, you know, there's grants out there for fuel modification, um, you know, around the structure. So stopping fires from moving structure to structure to structure is, is a, a big start. And that's all in the hands of the homeowners. And for industry, you know, there are, um, uh, there are groups out there that are developing technologies to be able to be used, whether it's, you know, in the actual home hardening yourself, like uh, closing in your soffits and um, uh, ember proof vents. Um, there, are, there are chemicals out there that are being um, developed that can actually be used in homes, um, around homes that are, um, you know, environmentally uh, safe through the EPA. To be able to treatment, use. right. Yeah, yeah, there there's some great chemicals out there. Uh MFB thirty one Citratech is a new one. I think you'll see that being able to be used, you know, in the in the in the private sector and eventually in the government sector. Um, you know, what was whether that it's it's a MFB thirty one Citratech. It's a it's a new uh food grade EPA uh safer choice listed uh fire retardant. Food grade um, sounds great. I mean, if I could food, sprinkle a little bit of uh, on my my bagel, you know, maybe I, the bagel wouldn't burn. Right. You know, maybe I'd be less flammable too. Right. You never know. Works on cellulose based material, and, and uh, you know, it, it's it's advancements in science and technologies like that that you're going to be able to put in the hands of the homeowners and property owners, um, and 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 be able to be utilized around properties to where we can mitigate you know the spotting action for instance as the fires you know trying to spot and ignite um there'll always be things that you can put into the hands of a firefighter to make their job easier i think it's more palatable you know maybe it's the way we engage um you know, utilize, utilizing something from a nozzle. Maybe it's fighting fire with a backpack. Maybe it's fighting fire, you know, with a with a fan or a jet engine or, you know, something new that we've not seen. Um, fire is in, insidious in that it's not smart, but it burns under material. So, you know, if you're in the redwoods on the West Coast, you know, I mean, those fires can be six or eight feet deep burning in duff. If you're in you know, uh, in, in areas where there's peat, it, it can burn under, you know, the peat. So what kinds of technologies can we engage in, in those fires, right? And, in in the duff fires, sure. um, can I use a backpack blower to, to disperse a chemical or do I need to use a hand pump like a, like a glorified, uh, a squirt gun, you know, hanging off my back, right? Those kinds of innovations, I think, the fire service is going to start seeing, you know, to be able to be engaged on their behalf as well as the homeowners. Well, during the early parts of the summer, you know, you can pick up these super soakers at uh, Wally Mart. And, uh, yeah. Right. right. As long as yeah, you've got. It, the water well, I mean, there. what's bad is like in some cases, like toys like that, you know, are are better than what a lot of uh, fire folks are being issued. Um, and I, and I would really love to see, you know, more tech, you know, put in the hands of the guys on the ground so that it's not such an act of labor so much as a, an act of using the tool. Wow, I said that, uh, you know, a lot of times I, I feel like firefighters aren't given the best tools and Dan disappeared. Boom. So clearly one of the, one of the tools we need to improve is Dan's Internet access so that he can continue to uh, carry on these conversations that hopefully lead to uh, better innovation and application. How, I welcome back, Dan. It's good to be back. It's good to be back, Steve. We... Excellent. I think we're back. Any, any, any new, other new directions that you see us moving in or would like to see the industry moving in? 
Well, I, I would like to see the industry kind of come to grips, not only with the personnel and the ability to be able to hang on to, you know, firefighters uh, across the board. Um, we play tug of war within the agencies, uh, you know, where the, the pay is better over here, but I can get hired here. And so Peter, you know, robs Paul. So I think having a, you know, this is outside of the technology world, but, you know, reality for firefighters is, um, having some sense of um, equality across the board for, you know, the wildland fire community. Being able to put um, tools and new technology, as you so eloquently said, that can be useful is a big deal. Uh, and the public can help there by engaging these new technologies themselves so that the firefighters aren't stuck in front of a house um, and, and we can go after the perimeter. But then on the, on the private sector, uh, you know, developing and proving yourself with the, with the tech that you're going to be able to um, develop and not leave it on the backs of the government to prove. Um, so I, I've seen that a lot in my career where um, when I was with the government agencies, someone would come up with a gee whiz idea and, and they would develop it um, to an extent. Um, but then they would give it to the to the fire agencies and expect the fire agencies then to further develop and and hone that tech. Um, everything needs to be uh, uh, I think honed right. We're not gonna uh, we're not going to develop something and not think that it doesn't need to be changed. It took twenty years of evolution for that seven forty seven. You know but it took someone really grabbing it and understanding what the government needed yeah. um, to be able to, to help themselves. But then it's going to take the government agencies and the fire suppression agencies um, some budgetary um, lead way, I think, and slack to be able to engage and, and utilize new technologies to give us, you know, in the, give people in the private sector an idea of what's wrong with that tech, right? Really love your tech. We tried it and we used it, but you need to tweak A, B, and C. And when you tweak A, B, and C, it's going to be fantastic, right? Um, being able to, I think, hook entrepreneurs up. I might have a device that's okay, but, you know, if I coupled it with uh, uh, another device over here from this person, it's going to be untouchable. So, I do feel that it's important for the private sector, the, the tech developers to maybe not be um, so close to their chest with their technology yeah. uh, and, and look at um, partnerships and engaging those technologies to be able to be more effective in the firefighters' hands, if you will. I, I don't right. know if that makes sense. No, that makes a lot of sense. If I've got a better spray gun and you've got a better chemical to spray and we get together you know, we could do way more than either technology by itself. Correct, correct. And it's going to take, you know, the lobbying power of the private sector, I think, for your local representatives to to understand what your local fire agencies are capable of and and then, you know, what kind of funding, you know, would would help improve their ability to be able to engage new technologies, right? Even if it's for proof of concept. Right. Those, sure. those proof of concept contracts are very, very limited and and almost non-existent. So um, I think proof of concept type um, contracts or, you know, avenues for entrepreneurs to be able to engage with the fire service, because the private sector is never going to be able to engage uh, fire in the way in which the tools and the tech being developed needs to be used and tested on so the only way it can get there let me ask you uh, to, like more more about that because it, it, you know if you'd have told uh, fred smith you know a private guy is never going to be able to compete with the post office and now fedex eats the post office's lunch every single day uh and profitably Correct. Uh, so so do you see a, a possibility of a future where uh where we see more of a privatization of fire suppression and fire protection? Well, you know, ironically, um, 
I think what was that movie, The Gangs of New York? Uh, that's really where where fire suppression started, right? It was the insurance industry, and it was really those those individual gangs that you know developed uh, fire suppression for insurance for. So they know, think they developed arson too. So it was kind of a mixed bag. Yeah, probably right. Probably I I, I don't know. I, I wrestle with that, um, Steve. To be frank. Um, if you put it in the arms of the private sector 100% and you have a, you know, a, a, a slower season where you're not getting your employees employed and you need more fire, eh, you got to wonder sometimes well, how those fires Well, they could have prepositioned asset contracts, standby contracts, exclusive use contracts, you know, that would compensate that. Yeah, I, I think... Um, uh, what I really think in, in my heart of hearts is that there needs to be a subsidy program, if you will, um, if the fire service, if the governments are leaning on the private sector, you don't want the private sector going out and starting fires because we need to be employed. Um, and, well, and no more seen, than we want, you know, Hughes Aerospace Lockheed or Boeing starting wars you right. know, to sell more missiles. And I, and I, I don't think that happens. Right. Well, right. Re well, recently. No, I, I mean, I've been a part of seeing that, you know, unfortunately on, on, on the other side, which makes me lean. But what could happen um, is there could be a subsidy, pro, a subsidy program, you know, that is engaged maybe by the federal government. So if, if it's going to cost me $6 million a year to run an aircraft and, uh, and it's going to be tough to get a contract and the government's not going to give me a 10 year contract because if something happens year two and they give me a 10 year contract, then they have to pay me out, you know, if it's their problem for the other eight years. So that's never going to happen at this point. I mean, that's a, that's a contentious piece right now, but you know, if I develop it and the government's going to use me, and it's a slow year, I still need to pay for the fuel and the engineering and the insurance and the employment sure. costs and, you know, the upkeep of the aircraft. Maybe there should be a subsidy program uh, sim similar to what farmers have, right? Uh, we have to feed America and sometimes we overproduce, sometimes we underproduce and there's always subsidies, but there's nothing out there in the line of, of, of having a, trained well-equipped private sector that all of a sudden when there's a slow fire season uh what's going to happen right i've just lost my tail and i can only stay in business uh, a, a very small amount of time to where i'm going to go out of business because i can't fund it so i think a subsidy piece there you know would be would be wonderful to to look at and and think yeah, about and the fire service maybe engage in more you know, SBIR type programs the way the military does. The, there's no shortage of people coming to the military with great ideas and coming away from those conversations with some funding to explore them. Uh, but, Correct. You know, and I don't you see, really a lot see that SBIRs. a lot in the fire service. Yeah, I don't see a lot of those SBIRs, you know, on the federal fire side of the house. And, and I don't know about the state fire side of the house, um, but I know there's a lot of stuff with NASA, you know, SBIRs. Yeah. With NASA, you know, um, trying to develop a problem, but I don't, you know, I'm a firefighter and I don't think NASA is going to hire me to fix their space problem. I, I, sometimes I wonder why we hire NASA to fix a fire problem. Yeah, well, because they can get eyes on the problem. But then again, you know, we, we don't have a, a, a space ray that can be fired from a satellite that puts out wildfires right. yet. Yeah, right? right, yeah. Which is, you know, who, who knows what innovation will bring and... uh you know, as long as we, we keep innovators uh, fed and, you know, give them some tools and some money to buy some parts, you know, we know, we have no idea what's, what could come in the future. Right. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Um, and so are fires, right? Fires expect there to, to grow by 30% by 2050. Uh, and then I'd like to see, you know, uh, the, the fire services around the world able to keep up with that. Correct. Right. And we have regions that now are, you know, with the current weather patterns burning that traditionally haven't burned. Um, you know, I've had the privilege of uh, fighting fire down in Bolivia mm -hmm. and, you know, there's, you know, Brazil has fires, Chile has fires, Colombia has fires, right? These, these fires, like I say, regardless of, of borders, they're going to burn. 
um, and it and really it it's about you know being prepared and if you've never been in the space before how can you become prepared um, right. are we in a world where we can seamlessly move about to help right can we can I take crews from here and go into a foreign land where cultures and customs are completely different? And, and I don't know, you know, if I'm going to go to Bolivia or if I'm going to go into Brazil or if I'm going to go into, you know, Chile. Um, there's a lot of uh, a lot of talk about international standards right now. And and, uh, you know, those are some groups I think that I'm, I'm fortunate to be able to be privy to and and you know, hopefully be a part of, but it's becoming a global problem uh, for sure where we see fires burning where they don't normally burn. So what lessons can we transfer to those countries and regions that we've learned uh, here and where oh, will that take our innovation? Yeah, right. We want it. We, we would like to have a world where we could seamlessly move the needed resources around, you know, where, where they're needed. Um, Obviously, in, in response, that sometimes requires some pre-planning, and people are sometimes not willing to invest in pre-planning if they've traditionally seen themselves as a non-fire threatened community. And, and I think that that, that type of um, thinking is really going to get people in trouble. You know, when, you know, you know I, like I'm, I'm proposing certain technologies uh, for, for wildfire mitigation. Uh, through Team Wildfire, and, and and I've called some communities, and they said, well, you know, we would have no need for that because we're not in a wildfire-affected area. Yeah, until you are, and then that attitude is what's caused you to not have any type of a viable response. Right, so, exactly. And we see that in other regions, right? I mean, uh, why would you need a fire response uh, in... in uh, Colombia or, you know, where you don't typically see fires in Europe or on the eastern seaboard of Canada, right, right. where they had, un, you know, unprecedented fire and, and damage. In BC, uh, yeah, terrible. Right, yeah. Well, Dan, I could ask you another 20 or 30 or 40 uh, hours of questions, which I will do, but I will have to do that on a subsequent episode. Uh, Dan Reese, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing a little, you know, a, a sampler of your wisdom and experience. I really appreciate that. Well, Steve, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a lot of fun. One of Absolutely. the first for me, for sure. All right. We're going to be seeing a lot more of Dan Reese on the show here. Uh, folks, you've been listening or watching The Fire Break, sponsored by Team Wildfire. I'm Steve Wolf. Take care.